Hi guys, this is GSN and I'm here with a review of the Uhans Max 2, a 6.44 inch metal phablet which is priced at $139.99 on gearbest.com. It has two cameras at the back, two cameras at the front, a MediaTek CPU, mid-range specs and it's available in black or gold. Uh, this device is basically a movie watching machine that's pretty good on the selfie side because it has two front cameras and a special selfie flash and it weighs a hefty 245 grams. Now, if you're wondering about the whole format and design, it feels familiar because it feels like a rival for the Xiaomi Mi Max 2. It's huge, it can easily be a rival for a 7 inch tablet, it's not far from 7 inches, and it obviously has a metal body here shown in black. Okay, so this metal body will tend to draw fingerprints and also draw grease. And at the back, at the bottom and the top side, you will find a plastic lid which is not exactly impressive. Of course, the phone is very wide and clearly it's a two-hand affair. You will not be using it with a single hand unless you want to be uncomfortable. The button feedback is quite good on this side here. I'm talking about the power button and the volume buttons. We got a pretty okay grip and a pretty big camera protrusion here at the back side. Now, other things we're mentioning, uh, well, if you're wondering about the sizes, uh, 9.2 millimeters in thickness and it weighs 245 grams. If you want to compare it to the Xiaomi Mi Max 2, that one is 7.6 millimeters and 211 grams respectively. So this one is a bit heftier. I would even go as far as to say it's a bit uh, beefier. Now, other things we're mentioning here, 6.44 inches in diagonal, solid build, no creaks. I would even say that the bezels are quite okay, uh, they're not uh, too thick, which is a good thing. We have a 2.5D glass panel at the front and that's about it. Okay build, but massive and totally huge and heavy. Now, on the display front, I got a 6.44 inch Full HD IPS LCD 2.5D fully laminated panel. The bezels are okay and the experience, well, let's check that out using the gallery app so here we go go to the download section and enjoy our typical test video now let's turn down the volume a bit in order to focus on the image i have to say that the colors look quite fine they're pretty vivid in my book here we go so vivid colors also pretty well calibrated and not bad brightness wide view angles contrast is also acceptable and uh, I feel that the black is a bit too white here, which is to be expected from an IPS LCD. Speaking of things which are expected from an IPS LCD, the pixels have an RGB stripes arrangement as seen under the microscope. And the brightness achieved here is not bad. We are dealing with a device that's priced below $150 and it's 390 lux units, which is quite good in my book. It beats the Huawei Mate 10 Pro and the Sony Xperia Z5 Premium, scores below the LG G6 and the Nokia 3, also the Blue S8, but still reasonable being close to 400 lux, which is basically our definition for a pretty okay device when it comes to the brightness. Now, in the display front, we got the mirror vision options. We start off with the picture mode, which can be set to standard, vivid or user mode. And if you select user mode, there are a ton of other tweaks for contrast, saturation, brightness, sharpness, color temperature, dynamic contrast and blue light defender, but I suggest you stick with standard. And then we have the following things, brightness level, adaptive brightness, sleep, the screen saver, font size, display size, and those are all the options for the display, a pretty solid screen overall, even though it's not 400 lux, but pretty close to it. Now, if you're wondering about the other hardware, I'm here to talk about the CPU. So we are dealing with a device that uses an octa-core MediaTek MT6750 OT CPU, quoted 1.5 gigahertz. We also have the ARM Mali T860 GPU, 4 gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigabytes of storage, plus a micro SD card slot. We did not experience any lag. The functioning was quite good. We did not have any freezes. And no matter how many apps you opened and no matter how many updates you did, things were fine. And I love the fact that there was no lag here which is something to behold. And we also experienced gaming with Riptide GP Renegade, our typical benchmark game, which from the loading seems to move a bit slow, but the actual game is quite okay. The CPU is not new by any means, but we have enough RAM and a pretty clean experience to serve it. Let's pick this Hydrojet and see how the game behaves. In my last attempt to play the game, it was fine. Nice frame rate, good reflections, nice texture. Turning down the music a bit. Here we go. 
as you can see everything feels fine the frame rate is okay i don't see any stutter and even if the animations are complex it doesn't drop a bit responds well to my commands quite sensitive actually okay and that's about it gaming wise now we proceed further this is truly a huge phone it's uh, hard to wield at times okay so when i say I proceed further it's time to talk about some of the benchmarks we did all the famous ones starting with antutu in antutu 6 we beat the lg q6 and the samsung galaxy a5 2016 scored below the motorola moto g5 and the sony xperia xa and we also did geekbench 4 which is one of the most famous benchmark tests out there those are the results achieved with the multi-core score we beat the motorola moto g5s and the motorola z play but score below the Motorola Moto M and the Huawei Nova and the Yumi Max. Now, in uh, 3D Mark, uh, we also took that one, uh, which is actually a benchmark used to check out the GPU. Uh, we scored 382, which beats the Yumi DGC Note 2 and the Huawei Mate 10 Lite. Not bad, but also scores below the Sony Xperia XA and the Huawei P10 Lite. Now, the performance is about, I would say, on par with the all view. Uh, Infinity N or View X4 Soul Infinity N and the All View X4 Soul Vision if you really want a comparison. Now we also did the temperature test or two and let's see how that came out. So we have a variety of results here. Now uh, we achieved 34.9 degrees Celsius when running the benchmark GFX bench, which means no overheating. And when running the game you saw before, a bit warmer at 37.3 degrees, but still no overheating, which is always good news. Now let's talk about the battery. On paper, sounds I would say almost satisfying. 4,300 milliampere hours lithium ion and a promised standby time of 2-3 days, or 10 hours of video watching, or 19 hours of talk time. Now let's see how we did so we did continuous HD video playback in a loop test achieving uh, I would say a rather modest time of uh, on-screen usage of 8 hours and 19 minutes it's okay-ish but not impressive it fits the regular range of mid-range phones priced at below $200 it's superior to the Lenovo K6 and also superior to the All UX4 Soul Infinity N but inferior to the pretty old OnePlus One and the Huawei Honor 6 now we also did PC Mark, which is actually not that bad. 7 hours 38 minutes. Of course, won't expect more from such a huge phone, but in the end, it's okay in my book for a mid-ranger. It beats the Motorola Moto Z, Huawei P10 Lite, scores below the Sony Xperia XA1 and the Blue Bull S1 plus the Lenovo Vive X3. The charging is a bit on the long side at 3 hours 55 minutes. Uh, it's actually close to the 200 placed phone in our top. It's superior to the Yumi Touch at least and the Microsoft Lumia 640. We did it in steps. 15 minutes means 12%, 30 minutes 23% and 1 hour 44%. It's time to talk about the charging. So I would have to say that this is a pretty long charging at 3 hours and 55 minutes. It actually places the phone close to the 200 place. At least it's superior to the Yumi Touch and the Lumia 640. The Yuhan's phone needs about 5 minutes to charge to 4%, 15 minutes to charge to 12%, 30 minutes to charge to 23% and 1 hour to 44%. Of course you go to the settings and battery and you got your standby intelligent power save plus battery saver plus there's also battery optimization so there's that in the end a modest mid-range typical battery now let's then talk about the acoustics as you can see we seem to be having two speakers here we only actually have the left one the right one is just for uh, design purposes you can easily cover it as you can see with the hand in landscape mode so that's not a good thing uh, but at least uh, you'll see that it's not that bad so we have fm radio we do not have bundle headphones and in the settings you can go to the sound and enjoy bs loudness now of course you're going to be using two players there's the pre-installed music one which will not spot my songs and there's play music which actually sees them and also has an equalizer which is available here and you can find it in the equalizer area obviously so you activate it we got genre settings we got five custom channels we got bass boost around sound preset reverb all the works we go back here and let's see what other stuff we got so let's listen to some tunes
Okay, so some quick conclusions. We are dealing here with a pretty loud experience. The clarity was good. Bass not bad. The back doesn't vibrate. There is no distortion here. And the highs and the voices are okay, of course, in the songs that do have voice. So we have FM radio. Mentioned that before. We do not have headphones bundled. But let's see how the device did in our decibel meter test. So we do two tests. One with an acoustic sample and one with a game. In the acoustic sample one, we achieve 87.5 decibel, which is okay. This applies to the front and the back and it's superior to the Motorola Moto G5, the Google Pixel 2 XL and the Huawei P10 Plus still it scores below the Samsung Galaxy A3 2017 and the Motorola Moto G5 Plus. The other test involves gaming, so we gamed in Riptide GP Renegade and scored 95.5 decibels which is quite okay. It's superior to two flagships from 2017, LG G6 and HTC U11. It's inferior to the Huawei Mate 10 Lite and the HTC U Ultra. Now this is what the acoustics are all about, not bad at all. I'm talking about the four cameras, two at the front with a flash and two at the back also with a flash between them. So both of them are similar. There are 13 megapixel plus 2 megapixel combos that will trigger bokeh capture. Not a big fan of the camera UI for one thing because it had or has or anyways sometimes it has a bug it will not respond to the touch it simply does not want to right now it's working as you can see takes quite fast photos the zoom is i would say reasonably fluid but not the fluid, most fluid in the world and sometimes it's stuck and will not respond to touch happens every once in a while we got hdr we got options here related to a picture size face detection touch shutter, auto scene detection, grid line, anti-shake, zero shutter delay, video quality, electronic stabilization, ISO and so forth. The main camera mode are pretty straightforward. We got your video, we got your beauty with options for a slimmer face, bigger eyes, panorama and something called SLR which is basically your bokeh mode. You just press this and select the amount of blur you want around the frame and that's about it. That's all the SLR action. So we get rid of this and let's go to the gallery of shots. As usual, we have a ton of them. You can see them all here, including the ones with the Rubik's Cube. So I'm going to start off with the daytime shots. I have to say, for a camera that had some glitches and uh, sometimes would not respond to my touches, talking about the UI, I was surprisingly amazed by the quality of the colors. And also the clarity is not half bad, so we have very good close-ups. And one thing that's uh, going bad for the camera is the HDR, it makes things too white. But in general, I was actually happy with the clarity and the quality and especially the colors. That's one example of failed HDR, regular shot, HDR shot, which makes things ghostly. If you try to zoom in, you will certainly lose quite a bit of details and every once in a while there will be a washed out picture or maybe a bit too blue. We proceed through the gallery and as you can see we have landscape shots, we have close-ups, we played with the HDR some more. Here we go, this is where we tried the zoom and we were not impressed because things got grainy fast. This is a shot with the sun in front of us and as you can see the HDR once again did not do the trick. Now selfies were a mixed bag, some of them are okay, some of them are well a bit too blurry and I'm not loving the skin texture and also the skin color. However, these were taken in the shade when you actually catch a bit of sun, things will look much better. And speaking of things that look better, once again, the colors were truly amazing here. I have to admit, it was a shot taken in full sunlight. That helps a lot, but overall, not a bad camera. The bag usually nowadays, when you see a phone from China priced below $150 uh, with a dual camera, you think, well, it may have some problems excellent texture here at this close-up almost an artistic shot and when it comes to the close-ups and the colors you'll have zero objections panorama is a bit modest at the size 56 32 over 544 pixels hdr is poor 10 times out of 10 we have some slightly greenish and bluish shots now and then but overall i would go ahead and put this on par with the asus zenfone 3 the huawei p10 Lite, maybe and I would even go as far as to place it in the top 5 uh, Chinese phones we've tested recently, priced below $150, so that's impressive. It's clearly above the Bluebo S1, even the Bluebo S8, so the folks of Yuhans did a fine job this time around with the dual camera. Okay, now the selfies, as I told you before, if you find the sun and you're patient, you can actually trigger some pretty nice shots. It feels sometimes that the camera is superior 
to the Xiaomi Mi A1, but that one was tested in the rain, this one in the sun, so we cannot compare it. Anyways, those are daytime shots. Now we have low light shots as well, and they are not impressive. Many phones fail in this area, even bigger ones, and this one, well, things are a bit foggy and murky. Street light halos are quite big. If you take close ups, you'll find that the texture is okay. We also have bluish areas, things are pretty dark. But the texture of objects and somehow those blue lights were, let's say, okay in my book. Here we go, some more shots. If you use the flash, things look a bit blue. As you can see here, lots of fog and lots of grain. This is certainly no Xperia XA and certainly no Zenfone, but comparing it to other mid-range phones from China, I would say that it's decent. That's the term used here, so not bad, but also no records were broken and things are still pretty foggy and murky. The daytime capture is about three times better. Okay, so we're done with the photos. Let's talk videos. I'm going to start with the day. Things are pretty simple. Full HD, MP4, 30 frames per second and 70 mega per second. I would say a pretty typical affair if you're talking about numbers and settings. So let's find the video, which is tricky here because everything looks the same. Okay, so I was listening to pretty loud music, here we go, looking at the clip, pretty fast and efficient exposure change. And one of the best things about this camera when it films is the microphone, it actually was quite good. It's a sunny January day, the details are poor in the distance, the colors are clarity are quite okay. Things are also a bit shaky and if you try to zoom in you will lose a lot of details and because the screen will not respond it was infernally hard for me to actually try and zoom in. Now let's find another video like this one here. So once again things are shaky, uh, there's too much refocusing going on. As you can tell, you'll also tell on YouTube better than here. But in the end, good microphone, good colors and not bad clarity. And exposure change was fine. Some dynamic range problems appeared towards the end when we actually shot a video with the sun in front of us. But once again, not bad and even compared to some Huawei phones, not bad at all. We did a stabilization test, obviously poor, but shockingly, there was no refocus there. So there's refocus here when you're panning and sitting, but when you're walking, no refocus, that's odd. I would put it on par or maybe superior to the LG Q6 and the Huawei Mate 10 Lite, which is no small feat. Now, this is the daytime, so let's see the low light video capture. Things are a bit poorer this time. There is no, this is bad, but there's just, this is bad. So let's find some of the nighttime clips like this one here. Uh, there was some music going on. And once again, the microphone was quite solid. Details were lost a lot. There's a lot of grain here. Uh, poor zoom, things are shaky, blurry. There's refocusing again, so not impressive. Aside from the microphone bit, it caught the music perfectly. And you can see things are moving in frames. So a low light video capture, not quite. And also a lot of blue in the image. I will stick to the daytime capture, I will stick to the selfies and the good colors of the pics. Now let's go to the aspects of the phone like the browser and connectivity. Okay, so I mentioned the browser, in this case we're dealing with Chrome. Okay, so it's time to load up our website, here we go, gsmdom.com, checking it out on Chrome. By the way, the benchmarks for the browser are not very impressive, I'm talking about Sun Spider and Velamo, I expected a bit better from them, but nope, at least in reality it loads up the site fast. We got this stock keyboard here and there's no swipe sadly, so that's the browsing experience, uh, fast at first sight, but the benchmarks are underwhelming. On the connectivity front, uh, we have the micro USB port here with OTG support, also special dongle bundled. We got the audio jack at the top, so it's here, don't worry, even though the trend is to leave it out right now. And here we got the other things, we got your Wi-Fi, your Bluetooth, there's 4G LTE, this is a dual SIM, dual standby phone, there's no NFC, there's Wi-Fi BGN, Bluetooth 4.0, GPS, bundled OTG cable, audio jack, and the calls were pretty loud and clear, and the microphone is also quite solid. Now, no complain about the microphone, no complain about the calls, so let's go to the Wi-Fi test, which was a bit underwhelming. Okay, let's see the results we achieved. So, uh, the top result here among all the tests was 35 mega per second downloads on Wi-Fi and 15 mega per second uploads. That's what we achieved. Uh, actually, it went as high as 25 mega per second, so it's basically 35 and 25 with a pretty big ping, so not very impressive in Wi-Fi. I actually downloaded the game Riptide, 
and it was much slower than usual so expected a bit more from this area now let's talk about the software now as far as the OS and UI are concerned let's have a look here and see what we're dealing with uh, this is Android 7.0 Nuga in a pretty stock version so when it comes to the multitasking let's first open up some apps like uh, for example we got your Chrome uh, we got your gallery here and we can also open the Play Store and luckily there is no lag and when you're talking about multitasking you're talking about the carousel and also the split screen so you can split the screen in two you can have half of the screen for chrome and you can also have the other half for the gallery so you can check out your pictures and browse the web at the same time so that's multitasking in a nutshell we go uh, further we keep the screen press the home screen and um, aside from triggering a widget we have wallpapers widgets and settings widgets are those ones they're stock pretty basic and straightforward settings are these ones the core ones now the drop down portion is also pretty straightforward and as you can see here we are using virtual buttons with an extra button here which lets you hide the virtual ones so here we have the notifications obviously and the quick settings which include the super useful super screenshot which offers the option to record the screen scroll do a scrolling screenshot or even a funny one with smiley stickers and all that jazz um, hmm, how you can close that down well pressing the X okay so exit that's about it and then we go to the settings and see what's happening here so we got your typical uh, wireless settings display notifications sound applications battery memory security and something extra called intelligent assist related to the navigation bar smart wake and the three pointer screen shot uh, as far as I know you should be able to take a screenshot like this and then we have the security which involves the fingerprint scanner from right here so let's set it up we start the process here no thanks one two three four one two three four done and now it's time to perform the setup it takes about 12 steps or so here we go we are done and now let's see just how efficient accurate and fast it is it requires a pin the first time and now let's see it not fast certainly but pretty accurate takes a while to unlock but in the end it works when it works now as far as the applications are concerned i counted them all there's only 29 of them and there's once again stock stuff we got your maps music messaging phone photos play games play music play store speed test oh, that's installed by me sorry sound recorder sim toolkit voice search and youtube the whole basic google android package so in a nutshell a pretty clean experience and with a bit of luck we may get oreo someday on this yuhans phone so we have reached the time of the verdict for the yuhans max 2 and the pros are as follows certainly a very good price below 150 dollars uh, no lag pretty okay build not a bad screen at all when it comes to brightness i would say the performance is okay um, decent battery when it comes to the video playback also not bad continuous usage uh, nice acoustics solid colors when taking uh, photos and videos great microphone throughout and clean OS now uh, these are the pros on the cons um, this is a huge phone closer to a tablet than a phablet it's got slow Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi problems kept disconnecting from one of my other networks the current one is okay the other one not okay not even by a stretch uh, charging is a bit on the slow side uh, the camera UI has some problems I'm talking about the screen being non responsive sometimes low light capture not impressive especially the video and speaking of video a lot of refocusing has been happening while we were filming and the fingerprint scanner is a bit on the slow side however we are dealing after all with a phone that's priced below 150 dollars and that's when you start to accept compromises and this phone has much fewer compromises compared to other handsets from uh, smaller brands from china i'm talking about the usual yumi blue boo elephone ligu 
Johnny, you name it, a lot of brands, they make compromises, but this time Johans made fewer, much fewer, even compared to their older phones, and that's nice. So, the best aspects about the phone, the camera's colors in pictures, the battery, not bad, the screens, brightness, the acoustics and the clean OS, all of them pluses, this is the kind of phone you can easily award an 8 or 9 out of 10 with no regrets and once again the price tag is at around $130, maybe $140, which is not bad for this binge watching and maybe gaming machine, certainly with a pretty okay camera in the colors front. This is it from gsnom.com, this has been the review of the Johannes Max 2, bye bye.